All right. So just a few questions hopefully we can answer today. How do we minimize aging? Uh, do I need healthy sun to get vitamin D? Um, is there such a thing as healthy sun? Uh, skin cancer, how do I protect from it? How do I minimize my risk? And then uh, when should you come meet somebody in dermatology? Um, so this is one of my kids. And uh, why do we need skin? Well, it protects us. We all know that it protects this little baby from just uh, everything going out in the water. Um, it keeps, uh, it's immune surveillance. The skin is an immune organ. It's always out there looking for cancers or bacteria or whatever you get on your skin. It keeps our temperature 98.6. That's why when it's cold, you go outside, your fingers get cold. Uh, it's a good organ to prevent cancer, sensation, how we feel the world, and uh, visual. A lot of how we derive who we are comes from what our skin looks like. Um, so let's start with aging. What causes it and how do I prevent it? Um, this is a little bit of a little diagram, um, but this is your skin. And we have this outer layer, the pink layer, that's the epidermis. You have this middle layer, this is called the dermis. And then you have a subcutaneous fat layer underneath all of it. And as you can tell, as we get older and wiser, we get a little thinner on all of our skin. Um, so let's just break that down. What does the outer layer do? So as we get older, the outer layer, the epidermis, it loses its moisture content. Um, and that's why our skin gets drier. We have to use more moisturizers as we get older. It gets more brittle um, and it gets more itchy. Um, in fact, if you come into dermatology and you have itchy skin, the first, the old adage is you can treat them with good moisturizer for a month before you do anything else because that cures most of it. Uh, cells turn over slower. Um, so substances, when you get something on your skin that's not good for it, it stays in contact longer than it would when you're younger. And then if we're going to treat, say, an athlete's foot, it just takes longer to treat it because the skin cells turn over slower. Um, and it gets fragile. So this is one of those egg carton mattress things that some people have on their beds. And when you're young, those, those uh, ridges are really high and there's a lot of uh, contours. As we get older, that smooths out. So you can imagine what happens then if you sh put sheer force on your hands, you know, you bump your hands. When you're young, nothing happens. When you get older, though, and you sheer force it, it just comes off so easy. And that's what you're seeing is this, this, the change in the contours on the mattress. So. And then skin cancer. This is the big issue with the epidermis. That's why most of you are probably here. As we get older, there's more variability in cells. We've had more time to live. Our cells have turned over more time, so there's more mutations that accumulate. Um, and that's irregardless of sun. And then there's the, uh, our immune system. It gets tired, and so it's not quite as active. It doesn't pick things up as quick. It doesn't get rid of the cancers as easy. And then the melanocytes, those are cells we all have. They protect us from the sun. They're the cells that when you go outside and you start to get a tan, What's happening is those cells, the DNA in these cells are getting damaged, and that damage in the cell, it's kind of like the airboy, airbag deploying in your car, uh, that signal gets transmitted out and you make more pigment. So the next time you see somebody with a tan, it's like driving your car with the airbag deployed. So. <laughs> all right, so here's the sun, all right? It does some good things. It makes vitamin D, and we're gonna, or helps our bodies make vitamin D. We'll talk about that. It kills pathogens on the skin. Um, but it does some bad things. Uh, sunburns, we're not going to talk too much about. It causes aging. I'm going to tell you a lot more about that in a few minutes. Um, and then we use it to treat skin disorders, like if you have bad psoriasis or vitiligo or some other things, we'll actually use the sun to help us. Um, but the way it works there is it depresses the skin's immunity. That's how it works. And that's also one of the reasons it causes cancer. The sun also causes DNA mutations. And this is down, you have a stem cell in the bottom of the outer layer of skin. And every month you get a new layer of skin. But if you go down into those cells, you can actually take the DNA and you can experimentally look at it and you can see there's certain mutations you can tell are from ultraviolet light. And so you can imagine if you hit the right gene, now you've got cells instead of, that are rapidly dividing. So instead of it taking a month to get a new layer of skin, it's a few days. Um, so you get mutations. And a lot of times, you know, we have probably all get a few skin cancers, you know, all the time and our immune system says, oh no, that's a bad cell, we better attack it and kill it. Um, but again, if, our immune, if we are suppressing the skin's immune system and we've got mutations, then sometimes cancers get through. So that's how ultraviolet light causes cancer. All right, so that's the outer layer. Now we're moving to the middle layer. This is called the dermis. When we're 30, or when we start with, if you take a 15-year-old kid and you go to the age of 30, they've already lost 20%, and by the time you get to 60, you've lost 50% of that volume. Um, 
you lose, there's a lot of immune cells in there, so that's a place where that is. And then you, get, you lose your collagen, you lose the elastic tissue. And we all know that when we look at our skin, um, we bruise easier. I tend to think of it when you're uh, 15, your middle layer skin's like this thick, your blood vessels are as big as the pointer thing. When you're 80, that's the layer is that thick, and the vessels are still there, and that's why when you're 15, there's all this cushion every time you bump your hand. As we get closer to 80, there's no cushion. Every time you have you know, just a little bump like that, and you got a bruise, it takes a few weeks to go away. Um, and then there's the other fun things we don't like, wrinkles and sagging and, oh, other stuff. And I think I have another diagram. So here again, there's the outer layer of skin, your epidermis. There's the middle layer of skin, your uh, dermis. Here's the ultraviolet light. And it actually causes the cells to make these chemicals called uh, MMPs or matrix metalloproteinases. And they degrade the collagen. The body never quite repair it or repairs it very well. And over time, then you get wrinkles and you lose the thickness. So that's sort of how that works. All right, everything else in the middle layer of skin, you get kind of more of a pale color. You actually get fewer blood vessels, but they're the same size and they're, you still bump them. You lose nerve receptors with time, so you don't sense pain quite as well, maybe not pressure quite as well, but you still itch, that's frustrating. <laughs> and then the size of the sebaceous gland. So every hair follicle has, and you have lots of hair follicles, except for on your palms, your soles, and your lips, and every hair follicle has a little oil gland. And as we get older, sometimes, in fact, many of us get these little things here where they just get tons of oil glands, like little donuts of oil glands surrounding the hair follicle. So that actually gets bigger with time. <laughs> Something to look forward to. Um, nails, you know, they slow down in growth. Uh, when you're 20, uh, your fingernail grows about 0.75 millimeters a week. And by the time you get to 80, it slows down to about half a millimeter per week. And your toenails even grow slower than that. So, Somebody comes in with a spot on their nail that looks funny, you say, well, it's gonna take a year to grow out. Um, and hair, the same thing, it grows slower. And then um, the diameter shrinks. So over time, uh, and this is why some of us, you know, lose our hair and go bald, is that diameter of the hairs shrink. And what you'll see, you know, often starts up in here and the hairs, instead of being the nice, thicker hairs, they get a little bit more curly, a little bit more uh, kinked kind of a thing, the way they look. And then eventually the hair fiber gets so small, it can't grow a hair, and then you get the balding patches. So that also happens. And then our hair gets gray because the pigment producing cells, those are melanocytes again, uh, they get tired and they quit making pigment and then you get the gray or the white hair. So. All right, so what causes it? You know, we, I guess we already talked about it. It's the sun, most of it, probably 80 to 90% of all the aging in the skin is from the sun. Um, it, so that would be extrinsic from the outside. It can be ultraviolet radiation. It can be infrared radiation. Uh, it can be the physical factors, the cold, the wind, and environmental, like when we smoke, we tend to get worse wrinkles, and we'll talk about that in a second. And there are in, there's things from the inside that cause change, too. We don't fully understand. It can be just, you know, using things, you get more wrinkles. If you smile, you get smile wrinkles. Um, there's things called telomeres, which are on the end of the DNA in the cells, and every time you divide, and remember we get a new layer of skin every month, every time they divide, they get a little smaller and smaller and smaller, and eventually you run out of telomeres, and the cells can't keep dividing. And here's a young buttock, and then an older buttock, it just has more of those fine wrinkles. Here's an arm when it's young, and then it's hard to see, but there's some yellowness there, some brownness, and also some fine wrinkles. That's right. And then this, are, this is a wisdom spot, otherwise known as a seborrheic keratosis, and it comes from aging. We're not sure if it's internal, uh, although you get more when you have more sun damage, but, and there's a lot of genetics that play into those. And Everybody in this room is over 30 has one, I can guarantee it, because I've yet to meet somebody without one. All right, so here's your young sun, and, or here's the young skin. You add some sun, you add some time, and you end up with photo-aged skin. Uh, what you can see is she's got, you know, coarse wrinkles, she's got some fine wrinkles, she's got lots of different coloration, she has kind of some, um, you know, brown spots. And you can imagine if she was fairer skin, she'd have even more brown spots. You kind of get that yellow, that sallow skin. Uh, you can get redness. You don't see it on her across the nose and cheeks from years of sun damage. You get more moles. The more ultraviolet light you get, the more moles you get. Um, it, then we talked about the other stuff there. And then the other thing you can get is this. These, uh, they're kind of like blackheads the teenagers get, but they're different. Uh, the sun-induced blackheads tend to be, it's that thinning of the middle layer of skin. 
And when we're young, our hair follicles are nice and firm. And as we get older, the ultraviolet light kind of causes them to just go, and they just kind of gape open because they've lost their support. And then you get these big combing downs. All right, so the question is, these are 52-year-old identical twins, both with very fair skin, lots of sun damage. Uh, but one of them smoked and one didn't. Any guesses, top or bottom? bottom. And why the bottom? That's right, the thick wrinkles, the deep wrinkles, smoker wrinkles. And it's not just for holding a cigarette in the mouth. It probably has to do with stuff that comes out of the smoke and the collagen doesn't repair very well and low oxygen and all sorts of things. All right, so how do you prevent aging? Well, you could die young. Uh, sun protection would be number two. Number three would be sun protection and number four would also be sun protection. And then there's a few other things. You could, you know, don't smoke, that'll help. If you are smoking, stop, it always helps. There's some antioxidants. I don't, there's not, it's not perfect science. Um, there are some topicals that could be used. This is a cream, so if you come in and you don't like your fine wrinkles, or you, what can we do as kind of a minor step for aging? There's a drug called tretinoin. It's now generic. The trade name was Renova. And these were the studies to get approved. You start with wrinkles here. This is the inside of the arm and then you lose the fine wrinkles. So you can see the difference, a little bit better, it's subtle, but that's a simple thing that can be done. And then there's a few other things. So we already talked, we'll talk about sun protection, stop smoking, there's the topicals. Um, there's skin resurfacing. So if you don't like the redness on the cheeks and the nose, there's lasers we have. They're designed for birthmarks, but they work for the redness of aging. Um, there's intense pulse light, uh, which uh, some people use to kind of smooth it out. There's the peels, the superficial stuff, which just gets rid of the outer layer of skin, not, or just the outer, outer layer of the skin. If you really want to make changes, you go to the deep layer. There's fillers, so if you don't like the wrinkles over here, you can put stuff in. If you don't like the double chin, there was a drug approved two weeks, well, in the last months to dissolve the fat down there. Yeah, <laughs> might be using it for other things. <laughs> and there's Botox, so if you don't like your forehead wrinkles or your or if you want to reshape your eyebrows, or if you want to get rid of your crow's feet, there, you can inject Botox. You can always see if a politician does it. So you get them to laugh, and if there's nothing happening up here or here, then you know they're doing Botox. <laughs> All right, so that's sort of aging. Um, so this is the next part of the talk. This is not something you want to see happen, if you can help it. Uh, this is a skin cancer, and hopefully everybody here would say, oh my gosh, I gotta get this thing looked at. And skin cancer. So there's three and a half million cases a year in the U.S. 2.2 million people a year are affected. So the number of skin cancers is more than all the breast cancers, prostates, lung, and colon put together. And we think that about 90% are caused by ultraviolet light. And the cost, the most recent year that they figured this out was about eight, over $8 billion. So an expensive and a big deal. Uh, what's your risk? So. Um, if you're non-Hispanic Caucasian, you live to the age of 65, probably 40 to 50% chance you will get some non-melanoma skin cancer in your lifetime. Um, are you at risk? Uh, it has to do with sun exposure. It's cumulative. So most of our most common form of skin cancer is basal cells, squamous cells. That's cumulative risk. Uh, elevation, we live, you know, it's higher if you live in more of an issue if you live in Denver or Red Lodge than if you live in Minnesota. How close you are to the equator. We have a few patients that grew up in Central America and then they move up here. Uh, they have some issues with that. Your skin type, you know, if you burn really easy, you've got red hair, you've got blue eyes, green eyes, you have a lot of freckles, all that tells us that you're very sensitive to the sun. Uh, your immune system. So uh, if you've had a kidney transplant and you're on uh, drugs to allow that kidney to live within you, your immune, your immune suppressed, you're much more likely to get skin cancer. If you have injured skin, so you had an awful burn, we see lots, or not lots, but a few times you'll see skin cancers develop within that burn or in that scar tissue. Um, radiation, so you've had breast cancer, those radiation areas have increased risk of skin cancer. Uh, certain chemical exposures, uh, you know, uh, genital uh, skin cancers are a lot of times caused by warts, genital warts. Welding, we see some welding people that didn't protect, that's a lot of ultraviolet light, they get a lot of skin cancer on their chest and on the arms. And if you've had a previous skin cancer, you're more likely to get another one. Uh, if you've had one, you're at least 50% chance uh, within five years getting another one. And it's higher if you're younger. So if you're in your 30s and you have your first skin cancer, um, it's going to be higher. If you had two of them, you're going to have a 75% chance of getting a second one. 
So, and this person has two cancers. Unlike other cancers, though, most of the time in the skin, they're discrete biologic tumors. They're completely different mutations, completely different. It's not like you have one here and then a metastasize. So, so basal cell, that's the most common cancer of any cancer. Uh, at least 2 million cases a year in the U.S. It's still increasing in incidence, probably 3% a year. It's rare that you would die from it. Um, I'm going to show you a picture in a little bit of bad things that can happen. Um, and uh, lifetime risk, so this is taking into account all people in the United States, and that's where you get you know, one in three for men, one in four for women. And that's another basal cell, and this is one tumor. And this doesn't look like much here, but that's part of the cancer coming down there. So that's all a little basal cell there. All right, and this is our picture of the skin. These are the basal cells. They're kind of little cuboidal cells down here. They're the cells that go wrong when you get a basal cell carcinoma. Um, and you can see here, just a little bit on the nose. And this could be like uh, they've had a pimple for three months and it just won't go away. Well, they'll get it looked at. Um, you can see very subtle, just a little red patch, maybe on the arm. Here's the classic pearly. They use the word pearly to describe it. It doesn't really look like a pearl, but it has kind of a little bit of an off-white look to it. Here's one right above the eyebrow. So this is a lady. This is from her blog that I took it. But she's got a very, very faint white spot there. It doesn't look, it's just a little scar. But that's a basal cell, so it can be very subtle. <laughs> so sometimes they do bad things. If you don't get them treated, they get bigger. So they can grow, they can spread, they can destroy things, they can cause severe disfigurement, they can destroy all sorts of things, they can be unpredictable, and they can metastasize. So some people think, well, basal cells are just little, they don't do anything. That's if you get them taken care of. They just get bigger and bigger and bigger. Here's a little spot on the ear. And this would be like, you know, every time you wash your, you're washing your hair uh, and you just rub your ear or you have a washcloth and you get a little bleeding. You know, you shouldn't be able to get your skin to bleed with a washcloth. If that happens, something's not right. Here's another little subtle one here. All right. So this is a little bit different. This is incredibly common. Uh, these little scaly little things on the hands. These are often, um, you rub your hands over them, they're kind of a hard scale. People often tell me it's like having like a little sticker in there. You rub your hand, it just doesn't feel quite right. And these are actinic keratosis. Um, actinic is from the sun, keratosis means scaly bump. And there's other, seberi, there's other keratoses. So the word keratosis is very nonspecific, but these are actinic keratosis. About 58 million people a year in the US have these, so incredibly common. And if you don't treat these, they have a chance of becoming a basal or a squamous cell. So the second most common form of skin cancer is squamous cell carcinoma. Uh, at least 700,000 cases a year in the US. And people die of squames. Um, you know, 3,900 to 8,800 people per year. Um, and again, if you don't catch it or it metastasizes, that's where the issues come. So where in the body do you get a skin cancer? So it makes sense, where do I get most of my sun? It's my nose, it's my cheekbones, the top of my ears. So that's the cumulative sun exposure. Um, but you can get it other areas. You can get it on the top of the scalp, you can get it on the neck, and then you can get it back, you can get it legs. You can see it in places like the armpits or the groin, where I don't think the sun's shown on these folks, and you know, there's things that happen that we don't understand. All right, so here's the back. You got a little crusty spot here. Um, turned out to be a little squamous cell carcinoma. Here's just a little white patch. I think I have a scar, Doc, but I don't know why it's there. Well, it turned out to be a sclerotic basal cell carcinoma. Or a little red patch. You know, they treat it with this little dermatitis. I get that from time to time. This one's been there six months, and I put some hydrocortisone on, it won't go away. It's a squamous cell carcinoma in situ. Here's a little spot on my nose. It just bleeds every time I wash it. Now oh, it's a basal cell. Little one on the cheek. Just a little spot, maybe a zit they thought. I don't remember what they thought. But okay, so what do you do about a non-melanoma skin cancer? So here you've got a basal cell on the uh, arm. And usually what you would do with a basal cell on the arm, you would usually biopsy to make sure you haven't missed a melanoma, because that'd be a big deal. So it's a basal cell. And what you do is you numb it all up, you scrape the edges, make sure it feels like it's clear. You take a pre-described margin around it, and then you take that all out. And you can't close a circle or it looks awful. So you take a little triangle on each side. Sometimes on the arm, you even make it into a little bit of an S and it even looks better. 
So that's called a surgical excision. That's the most common for a skin cancer not on the face. Electrodesiccation and curettage, if it is a superficial basal cell, so it's very high up in that epidermis picture or a squamous cell just in the upper layer like, we, you know, like the diagrams we showed earlier, then you can scrape it and burn it. You just numb it up. You take a little device called a curette and you scrape it. And the premise behind that is skin cancer. Once it, normally your cells hold together really tightly. But once you become a cancer, your cells don't hold together and they kind of fall apart. So you can kind of feel that when you scrape. Um, and then certainly the best treatment is Mohs surgery. So if you've got one of those basal cells on the nose, you know, you can't take a big chunk like that off the nose. Most of our noses aren't that big. And most of us don't want that off our nose. So that's the Mohs surgery. And actually, I'll go to this picture where you say, OK, I can see that, but you're not sure how much is underneath it. So you take a layer, the Mohs surgeons do this, and they map it right there while you sit and wait. And they find, oh, there's still a little bit here, and there's still a little bit here. And then they take the last little bit, and it's all clear. And the purpose of Mohs is to take all the tissue with, with as little normal skin as necessary to cure the cancer. So that's the whole purpose of it. So if you've got just a basal cell on your arm or your back, you don't need that. But if it's on your forehead or nose, you probably want that. Um, and these should be main headings. Topicals. If you have a really high up, very superficial or an in situ lesion, sometimes you can use topical fluorouracil. People hate it, but it works really well. Uh, Amiquimod is another one that can be used. It's approved for basal, superficial basal cells. Um, basically stimulates your immune system to attack the cancer. And we're using a little bit in some, some melanomas, very specific melanomas, though. And there's some other treatments which we don't use very often. They're not great unless you really need them. There's something else going on, radiation, liquid nitrogen, or photodynamic <laughs> therapy. All right. Yeah, so this is something. Actually, it doesn't hurt. It doesn't itch. And the reason it's gotten so big is I think it didn't bother anybody. But you can tell something's not right. You've got some white skin here. You've got certainly that's bad, black. White there, red, light browns, dark browns. So that's a melanoma. And here's another one, just a little pink little nodule. This one's growing pretty quick. They say it wasn't there two months ago, and now it looks like this. So these are melanomas. This is the big deal, one death every 57 minutes. That's US numbers. Still increasing at about 3% a year. Lifetime is pretty significant. One in 39 for guys, one in 58 for ladies. If you catch it early, you know, you're the five-year survival or the chance of still being alive in five years is pretty good, 99%. If it goes to the lymph nodes, that chance drops to 65%. And if it shows up in your liver, your lung, or your brain, or somewhere else, that really drops to 15%. Um, are you at risk? <laughs> Sun exposure, and I showed you the foot. That was probably not the right picture. But <laughs> um, Blistering sunburns. So the cell that gives rise to a melanoma is deeper down. So all that cumulative sun exposure, the nose, the cheeks, that's not your highest risk of melanoma. Your highest risk of a lady is that back, or is the, uh, the legs, and for guys, it's the back. And it's probably because the risk for melanoma, it's that peeling or blistering sunburn you had in childhood. That's where your risk really comes. And because the cells, when you get that bad sunburn, the cells that would give rise to a basal cell or squamous cell, they're high up, they get shedded, your body just kills those, and that's the peeling that you're doing. But the melanocytes are deeper down, they get mutated, but they don't die. And that's why the peeling, sun, you know, the blistering sunburns are your risk factor for melanoma. Now, uh, if you have over 50 moles, your risk of melanoma doubles. Uh, if you've had atypical or dysplastic or Clarps moles, they'll t send you the letter that says it's normal, but it's a little bit off. Uh, that also increases your risk of melanoma. If you have red or blonde hair, blue or green eyes. In fact, in the last year, there's been some studies on just red hair being uh, in not only are you really sensitive to the sun, but there's something wrong with the red pigment. And the red pigment may stimulate cancer production in the skin. So that's a new uh, area of research. Family history. So if you've had a parent, child, or sibling with the skin cancer, then you should get your skin, or with the melanoma. With the melanoma, you should get looked at. And again, personal history of melanoma. If you've had one, probably about a 9% chance of getting another one. Um, and you have increased risk if you've had non-melanoma skin cancers, breast or thyroid cancers. And again, if you have a weakened immune system. So again, your transplant patients. We have a lot of patients now on drugs for rheumatoid arthritis or psoriasis, these biologics, Humira and all these. They have an increased risk of melanoma. Not a lot, but a little bit. Well, what do you do about it? So you can change what you can change. Be observant, pick up things early, and then be smart. Um, so how do you pick up a melanoma? These are all pictures of melanoma. Um, 
So A is for asymmetry, and we're going to show you, we're going to get you good at this in the next <coughs> five minutes or so. So you cut it, this lesion in half, it is definitely not symmetrical. That's asymmetry, get that lesion looked at. B is border. We like nice smooth borders. This has all these like cookie monster bites out of the edge. That's a problem. Get those looked at. Uh, color. We want one color. This has got is that gray, blue, light brown, dark brown. That's too many colors. Get it looked at. And diameter. Anything over six millimeters deserves to be looked at. And then E is evolving, which so this is the same back, and uh, you can see that this here, and then three months later, it's a lot different. Uh, that's the melanoma. Or if you get a mole that itches for no good reason, or bleeds. Uh, or it's tender. We've had a couple that just didn't look like anything. And just, you know, Doc, every time I put my hand over it, it hurts just a little bit. And sure enough, it's a melanoma. So. There's a new study saying maybe we should call it, instead of the ABCDs, maybe that's too hard, we should call it the UCK of melanoma. <laughs> so if you've got an uneven lesion or uneven bordered or a changing lesion. All right, so let's go through these. Asymmetry. So this is, is that symmetrical or asymmetrical? Symmetrical. symmetrical. So that's okay. Asymmetrical. It's a melanoma. Asymmetrical. It's a melanoma. All right, let's do border. Sharp or ill-defined border? Sharp. Sharp. So that's okay? Uneven. I got the answer at the top, I guess. But all right, uneven? Uneven. And man, that's, you can see it comes all the way down here, all the way out there. So. Uneven. So melanoma can occur on the feet. And in fact, on the bottom of the foot, your risk is the same whether you're Caucasian, African-American, Asian. The risk is basically the same. In fact, Bob Marley, the old reggae guy from Jamaica, if you go to the Jamaica the Museum, the Mar Marley Museum in Jamaica, they tell me, I've never been there. He didn't, they don't think he died of melanoma, but it, the story is that he died of a melanoma on his foot, so. All right, color. So this is one shade, one color, probably okay, actually. The benign dermal nevus would be the name of that. Yeah, so red, white, and blue looks beautiful on our flag, hanging from a flagpole. If it's in a mole, it's a problem. Get it looked at. Uh, and you can kind of see here, is this gray, is this black, you know, red, um, too many colors. Uh, Again, two or more shades. So you've got a little bit of white here. This isn't skin color. You've got light brown, dark brown, gray, black, blue, too many colors. And the same one, too many colors there. You've got dark brown, lighter colors. So diameter would be, D is for diameter, six millimeters. This is less, you can't tell, that's okay. This is greater than six millimeters. So is this greater than six millimeters. Um, some people think we should change the D to dark. And uh, so if you've got a bunch of brown moles and then you end up with one that's black, Get it looked at. Um, and then evolving. So this is another picture. So, you know, they took a picture here. He comes back in three months, and it looks like that. Or maybe they took these pictures at home. You can do that, too. And you can tell all the other ones are just fine. It's just that one that changed. And here's another example. So it starts out here. You can see it growing, growing. That's a problem. The ugly duckling phenomenon. This is kind of what we do, too. When we look at your moles, we say, OK, you've got this pattern. So let's say these are like you know, light brown moles. Then you've got the one black mole. OK, that's bad. Or one mole that just doesn't fit with the pattern. Or some people have two different types of moles. So they've got this type of mole. They've got this type of mole. So then you say, OK, that's their mole type. But then what's this thing? You better get that off. Or maybe you're somebody who doesn't have hardly any moles, then you grow something. Better get it looked at. So that's a melanoma. You can just see all the colors, asymmetry. It's got it all. Yeah, asymmetry, border regularity, multiple colors, diameter greater than six millimeters, and probably evolving. If you, if you left it, it would change. And that one's a benign mole, no worries. I borrowed this from the web. I thought it was kind of an interesting one. Yeah, it's John McCain, and you can see he's, here's his lentigo maligna on his cheek. So very subtle. Lentigo malignas are a different form of melanoma. It's a slow-growing form of melanoma. It tends to be around for years before it goes anywhere. And, um, and it, that one is from chronic sun damage. So that's more on the, it's on the theories that get lots of sun damage. So, so this one's asymmetric. You got this little pink and dark brown over there. So that's a little melanoma. Yeah, how do we treat melanomas? So this slide, I, I gave a talk, some of this a few years ago. 
And this slide I had to redo completely because it's a lot better now to get melanoma than it was even five years ago. So the most important thing if you get a melanoma, to get it out as soon as possible before it goes anywhere. Um, Mohs micrographic surgery, they don't, we don't do the same Mohs surgery for these. If it's, if it's one of those on the face, then sometimes we'll do something like Mohs where you actually check the margins. But most of the time we want a big hunk of skin all the way around because you want clear margins and then lots extra because sometimes melanoma spits out little cells and causes all sorts of problems. If you have a melanoma and it's of a certain depth or has really scary characteristics under the microscope, then you need a sentinel lymph node biopsy. Um, if you can't, so first you feel the lymph nodes and if you can feel something, then you take a biopsy of it. If you can't feel anything and it's of a certain thickness, which is actually a millimeter, if it's over a millimeter, uh, then they actually inject dye into your melanoma and then they go into the lymph nodes and look in there and see if it's in there and then they take that out and look at it. So that would be the next step. And we've been doing that for a long time. But these, this is where the fun stuff is, the immunotherapy. So there's a drug, ipilimumab, which stimulates your immune system to go attack melanoma. And it seems to work okay. Um, and then the targeted therapies, if you have a thick melanoma, they're always gonna do this beat, they're gonna check and see if there's a certain mutation in the melanoma. And if there's that certain mutation, then you've got a drug that can treat for that mutation. So you get, a, you get extra months. It isn't like the body just says, oh, I guess you blocked my mutation, I'm fine. The body's dividing and it's looking, looking, and so six months or five years later, eventually it'll go around that mutation and you still have problems. So lots of new things coming out here. And it, we're seeing patients living a little longer and doing a little better. So it is kind of exciting. Um, there's some chemotherapies. Uh, radiation, very rarely. Once in a while for a metastatic melanoma, we'll they'll get a radiation. And then there's always clinical trials. All right. So here we go, vitamin D. <laughs> Sunlight increases vitamin D production and therefore decreases skin cancer. No, I wouldn't be talking up here if it was. Sunlight causes cancer, that's a fact. Does smoking or the sun cause more cancers in a given year? Sun. Now, more deaths, maybe smoking. I don't know the number. I don't know that for sure. But for, but for a number of cancers, the sun wins. So there are a couple facts. You know, ultraviolet B is one of many sources of vitamin D. Um, and there are ways to get vitamin D that don't cause cancer. So lots of good foods. You can take it as a supplement. So you don't need the sun for vitamin D. Um, there are a lot of associations with vitamin D, okay? Maybe you're less likely to get a bunch of different cancers. Maybe the autoimmune diseases do better with vitamin D. And so there's a lot of associations. But association is not like cause and effect. It's just an association. It's not proven. And this is the trick when you read stuff that gets into the newspaper. Every day somebody comes in with something they read. There's lots of associations, but it's not proving cause and effect. That takes a little bit more rigorous study. So this was in 2010, the Institutes of Medicine, they do a really good job. So they get the experts in the field, they look at all the data, they actually have a bunch of researchers that go out and pull all the data together. And what did they conclude? They concluded that the evidence for associating vitamin D status with outcomes not related to bone health was inconsistent, inconclusive as to causality and insufficient to inform nutritional requirements. In other words, vitamin D is great for your bones, that's why you take vitamin D. Everything else is, it might be helpful, I think is best you can say. Does that make sense? Yes. All right, so they did, uh, so these are the current recommendations that they came up, they met in 2002, it got published anyway. So if you're one to 70, 600 international units today, greater than 70, 800, and you can check your levels to see where you're sitting to start with. And you know, if you're gonna get it from the sun, Boston, you know, three minutes in the summer, you can get it, Miami, three to six minutes year round, you're gonna get 400 units. Um, but it's very difficult, seasons make a big difference, all sorts of things uh, play into your vitamin D production from the sun. So you can just take a supplement or drink vitamin D in you know, milk or something like that and you'll be fine. And the heart of the vitamin D, I think, debate is this. This is, this is a quote from the New York Times. If you were asked to enroll in a trial of a new drug that was thought to help reduce cancer risk, you might say yes. But what would you say, though, if you were told that the vehicle, what that drug is mixed in, in which the drug is given, is a known carcinogen that also suppresses the immune system and accelerates aging? No way in heck would I enroll in that study, right? <laughs> so that's vitamin D. All right. So just sun. Uh, here's a beautiful young lady, uh, fair skin. How much sun damage does she have? Ooh. So we can do that with everybody, probably. In, but you can see there's sun damage is an ultraviolet light. 
So, so what should we do about skin cancer? What should you do? What should we do? Well, you should look at your skin. Um, I don't know if we all need monthly self-exam, but if you've, you know, ever had a skin cancer, if you're at all high risk, you know, monthly self-exam. It's not that you come out of the shower every day, take a look, move on. No, this is a concerted. You're planning for it. You're thinking about it. It doesn't have to take more than a couple minutes, but you come out of the shower, you look in the mirror, you look at your front, and if you have a spouse or somebody you love, to look at your back, and if not, you take a, or somebody you love that doesn't want to look at your back. <laughs> You take a mirror, a little handheld mirror, and your big mirror there, and you can just take a look. And it won't take you long, and you can look down here. And so a monthly self-exam. Or, you know, I'm married, I got a few kids. In fact, two of them are back there with my wife. Uh, they thought they'd come cheer me on. You can do a mole night. Uh, you know, they always tell me you're supposed to do date night. Um, but what about doing a mole night? Just look at your partner's moles. Bring roses if you need. <laughs> And, you know, right away people laugh and they say, oh, that never happened. My husband will never look. He won't know what he's looking at. Or, but you give it time. You just start doing it month in, month out. And I've seen this happen so many times. They get good at it. And then that person comes in with that second melanoma. And we caught it. In fact, this happened last week. Changing mole. Her husband said that's not right. Came in. It was another melanoma. We got it really early. So it, it, you can, they can learn. Guys can learn, right? <laughs> I have a few uh, wives that their husbands send in. But most of the way, it's, it's the other way around. All right, so that's when you come to see us. So you do this, you, oh my gosh, I got one of these lesions. Something to look at. These are our dermatologists. So this is Dr. Lund, he's one of our Mohs surgeons. Dr. Jones, the other Mohs surgeon. Uh, Dr. Ma or, uh, Spenny, Dr. Williams, Dr. Matthews. So if you get a biopsy done here, she's the one looking under the microscope at your specimen, and she's really good. And then Dr. Clayman, Dr. Reno, and myself. And they're all really good, but our pathologist is really good. So, And then here's our whole department. So you probably, your nurse, if you've been up there, is in there. So when you come to see us, you got a newer changing mole. You know, you get new moles, uh, probably when you're a teenager or an elementary school kid. And the study was done in Denver. You get about five new moles a year. Um, as we get older, we get less new moles. Once you hit about 30, 35, you should have most of your moles. So if you get a new mole and you're over 35, probably get it looked at. You get a zit, you think it's a zit. Two months later, it's still there. Mm, might not be a zit. A spot that bleeds with washing. Your primary doctor recommends you get it looked at. I've seen this many times where two years ago they told them to come in and they still haven't come in and then we would have been a lot easier two years earlier. Um, a screening exam. Do you need a screening exam? You know, like if you have a colon and you're over 50, you need a colonoscopy. But the skin exams aren't quite as clear. The, the, the data just isn't there. Uh, so the Institutes of Medicine, they've looked at it and they said, well, there's insufficient data to recommend uh, you know, yearly exams or every five-year skin exams for people. Now, if you're a high-risk person, you've had skin cancer, that's all different. Um, and then if your wife directs you, you should go in, too. Always <laughs> All right, so how do we, how do we uh, let's say we think we buy into the sun causes cancer, we want to try and be smart about it. So first off, the peak sun in, this, in the summer with daylight savings is 10 a.m. to 4 p.m. when you are taller than your shadow. Um, and then you want to seek shade, whether it's natural, whether it's an umbrella, whether it's structure. And, and this is just an example at 10 o'clock in the morning if you stay outside because sunlight, it's radiation, it's cumulative dose. So it builds up as you're outside there. That, so you can stay out for short periods with a lot less issues than long periods. And if you come in and out, it's cumulative, so it's still adding up. So you want to protect yourself. Uh, so a wide, three-inch wide-brimmed hat. Some people tell me they get more comments if they have a nice big hat, they get more respect. So it might be a good idea. Clothing, long sleeved, never go without a shirt. And long sleeve pants are good. Long pants. Or long pants, sorry. <laughs> All right, uh, clothing protection, uh, t-shirts. <clears throat> so I have four kids and getting them outside is quite a challenge and then sunscreen on takes a lot of time. And then you forget to reapply and then they get burned and that's a lot of pain, we don't like that. Especially if you're a dermatologist, your kids can't get burned, that looks bad. <laughs> so we find that, a, you know, you just put a sun shirt on, then you've got the hole here, you've got a wide-brimmed hat, and the first few times you encourage them to keep it on, eventually they start wearing it, and then they're on, and you don't have to worry about reapplying the sunscreen other than a little bit on the hands, a little bit across here, because everything else is covered. And then you think about, oh my gosh, some people say, well, it's going to be too hot, I'm going to get too hot, but you think of the Arab countries, they dress in all this stuff. Partly that's culture, but it protects them, 
And it's, it, sometimes it keeps you cooler. It keeps all the infrared light off. It keeps the ultraviolet light off. It's not always warmer. All right. So like a white t-shirt, if it gets really wet, it loses a bunch of its uh, light. That's why there is some benefit in some of the fabrics. But any shirt's better than no shirt. And then we get to sunscreens. They're the last ditch effort. So let's go back to sunscreen. So there's ultraviolet B. And here's how they penetrate. Again, here's your outer layer of skin, the epidermis, your dermis, and your, they call it hypodermis, or the fatty layer. So ultraviolet C all goes out in the ozone layer. Ultraviolet B just goes down to the outer layer of skin, and that causes sunburn because it's frying you up here. And then ultraviolet A, which is your tanning beds, and naturally, and penetrates through some windows and things, um, that penetrates a lot deeper. So your ultraviolet B causes sunburn. Your ultraviolet A causes aging. But they both can cause cancer. Um, I'm just saying that again. All right, sunscreens, uh, there's different types. There's the physical sunscreens, you know, in the 70s, the lifeguards, maybe 80s, they had the white stuff on their noses. That was just zinc oxide. You can buy it in the diaper section at the store. It's the same stuff. And it's just a particle. It just blocks it, sends it back out. Now we have nanoparticles. They're nice. They're safe. You can spread them. You hardly know you have it on. And they just shoot the ultraviolet photon back up or the ultraviolet light back up. Then there's the chemical sunscreens. Most of our sunscreens are that. So they come down. Uh, the the uh, ultraviolet light gets absorbed by whatever the chemical is, turned into infrared light, and then you know it doesn't come into the skin and cause cancer. And there's different types. Um, you know, you just want something. Let's go to the key. Big, these are the keys. So you want to make sure it says broad spectrum on there. So when you go to the sun store, you want it has to say broad spectrum. You know, the higher the number, the better. The SPF number, sun protective factor, is only for ultraviolet B. Now, the UVA is a star system. And that's zero to four stars. There's no four stars currently available in the US. So uh, you got to apply enough. If you're out at the beach, it's a, it's a one ounce shot glass filled up, covering your body, reapplying every two hours. So your thing of sunscreen isn't going to last more than a day or two. If you're just covering your hands and face, it should be a teaspoon. Most of us put about half that on. And this is concentration dependent. So if we put half of it on instead of an SPF 30 sunscreen, you just dropped it to an SPF 15. And that may not be enough for you. And then sunscreens, they get sweated off. They get worn off. If you have a chemical sunscreen, they actually get broken down as they get used. So they don't last that long, maybe every two hours. And then you know, if in the winter, a, morning sun, or a moisturizer with an SPF factor can be really helpful to prevent aging. <coughs> All right, these are all false statements. The higher the SPF, the longer the exposure. In theory, it's true. But in reality, when it gets worn off and broken down, that's not true. You don't want to put it on the same t as bug repellent, especially if your bug repellent is DEET, because you actually have done these studies. Your DEET penetrates a lot better if you put sunscreen with it. We don't want that. Uh, there's no such thing as a waterproof sunscreen. There's no all, or, yeah, there's no all day or eight hour sun protections. There's no instant protection. Nothing that blocks all harmful rays. And a safe tan. Again, going back to a tan is like driving your car with the airbag deployed. If that's safe, you can call it safe. But if not, it's not safe. <clears throat> um, sunscreen, you need a new bottle every year. I don't, you know, they have a shelf life of three years. If you keep it in your medicine cabinet, great. If you keep it in the car, it gets that heat. And it gets it's probably not going to last uh, even those three years. And then if you just remember to use sunscreen if you're in the water, snow, or at the beach in the sand. This is from Australia. You know, if you take a bunch of Caucasians and Irishmen and you put them in the, at a very low latitude with tropical sun, you're going to get a lot of skin cancer, and that's Australia. So they have a huge problem. If you go to their schools, they'll have, uh, like, uh, roofs on their playground. They're outside, but just to protect them. <clears throat> and so they have the seek, slip, slap, slop. So it's seek the shade, slip on photoprotective clothing, slap on a hat, slop on the sunscreen. And that's what I would recommend you do as well. Uh, tanning beds are safe, you know, not really. They're like the sun. And in fact, you get more ultraviolet A from a tanning bed than you would from the sun, a day out in the sun. So you have to be really careful. Tanning bed light is safer than the sun. Uh, no, you're less likely to burn, uh, but you get 15 times more ultraviolet A than you a day outside up to that. And it penetrates deeper in the skin. So if you want to look old, this is what you can tell your kids or grand. You want to look old, you want to have that wrinkled, leathery, sallow, discard look, yeah, go ahead. All right. 
So the World Health Organization considers cigarettes in a more dangerous class than the sun. Now they're in the same class. So wear your hat, your sunglasses, your sunblock, your photoprotective clothing. We had some issues with legs though. But. All right, so that is sun. Um, we can talk a little bit about dry skin if you're interested. Okay, so we have bathing or showering should be minimized to prevent dry skin. It depends. So if you don't put a moisturizer on, the answer is yes. But if you're going to use a good moisturizer, you're going to be smart about your bathing habits. So if you're going to minimize soap, scrubbing, etc., if you're going to use water that's not too hot, not too cold, if you put a moisturizer on within three minutes, then you can probably do it. And moisturizers within three minutes, you have to do that. Otherwise, it all evaporates out and makes you, leaves you much drier, much worse off than before. Thicker is better. Um, so Vaseline ointment's good. But most of us don't want to be super greasy and leave a trail everywhere we go and you can't get it out of your clothes. So cream-based are good. There's a couple Vanna cream and just the cheap CeraVe cream. There's an expensive CeraVe. It doesn't add a whole lot for most people. Um, and then there's, these are okay. There's are good ones as well. They're not quite to this standard though. And lotion, by definition, is water-based. So they actually, in many cases, dry your skin out and end up, it feels really good for a few minutes, but four hours later, you're kind of really dry again. That tells you it's not working. With one exception, there is one lotion that's pretty good. It's uh, Restoraderm by Cetaphil. And it's a lotion, it's really light, but it's a new, it's kind of the, I think we're gonna see a lot of these in the future. It's uh, made out of ceramides, which is one of the things that's deficient in us that have dry skin. So that would be an okay lotion. So how, how often should kids with eczema bathe? Daily. Um, it's fun. Uh, these kids actually, it's one place they don't itch. You get to get off all the bacteria and junk they've been in. It gets all rid of all the dead skin. And it actually can be hydrating as long as you grease them up right away. And this is kind of for all my patients with eczema. It's soak or smear. You blot dry. You apply your prescription to the red itchy spot. You're good and high quality moisturizer. And you repeat this daily and you put another layer on another time during the day. And this is just really dry skin. Again, we now know why it is, right? We talked about aging, thinning of the outer layer of skin. We understand a little bit better. You know, cholesterol is one of the three natural mm, oils we need in our skin. So if you're on a cholesterol-lowering medication, that might lower your cholesterol in your skin, causing dry skin, making it itch a little bit. Some of us have bad genetics. We live in a dry climate. We heat our house with forced air. And then maybe we really like really hot showers. We like to scrub a lot. And we like rubbing alcohol. That'll help. That'll dry it out. <laughs> and so this is just really dry skin, that dry riverbed. This is... Maybe, I think I'm just about done with my slides, but this is kind of the last, uh, uh, this is the really cool 2006. So why do people get eczema? That's the question. And there's some genetics. This is a protein called filaggrin, And you can see this is normal skin. This is a person with eczema and they don't have any filaggrin. And we now realize that some of us have bad filaggrin, and that's why we get dry skin. And filaggrin is, if you think of the outer layer of skin like a brick wall, filaggrin is the mortar. So if you don't have any or it's not working right, Water's going to go right out. Stuff like sweat and all the stuff you put on your skin is going to go in and make you itch. So, so wear your sunscreen. <laughs>